Well, turning our attention tonight to what we have for us in the scriptures in Matthew 22, I want to talk to you tonight, first of all, about professional wrestling. It's usually not the topic you come to church to hear about. It's usually not the request made of many. But professional wrestling can help us. Now, if you're not familiar with professional wrestling, it became popular as a form of athletic entertainment in the 20th century and continues in many corners of our country and beyond into other countries to be a form of entertainment, of popular expression. The theatrical artistic, artistic display of athleticism where people are doing some bizarre things and you're kind of wondering, is this real? Is this really happening? It's in this entertainment industry you've learned of such household names like Randy Savage, Hulk Hogan, Triple H. Some of you are like, I don't know who you're talking about. The Rock? <laughs> Dwayne Johnson, who's now the most highest paid actor in Hollywood, began in his popularity through wrestling. Other names like this that perhaps have become household in other people's households, not your own, but nevertheless have become quite popular. When you think of wrestling, though, when you watch it, you think about the theatrics behind it. It's this entertaining drama, these different caricatures of people who hate each other. And then every now and then, these wrestling organizations will throw these all-together crazy matches where they'll bring seemingly opponents at one point together, now joining the same team as they go up against another opponent. They've had all kinds of these tournaments, like World War III, where 60 wrestlers get into three different rings at the same time, going at it with the requirement that the need to be thrown over the side of the ropes as to how you can tell is going to be the last man standing. But then there's also the events like the Hardcore Battle Royale, the Tag Team Battle Royale, the Thunder Bowl. It's all so crazy and theatrical. But we tell ourselves as we maybe watch these things, like, well... It's obviously not real. Outside of somebody maybe being injured some, it's not really until death. But what if it did not end that way? What if the goal in such matches really was to end with the death of someone? Someone will die. The question is who? Where wrestling is considered in this regards, it's not even considered as being a point of concern. But what if one person, the object of so many other people's wrath, were being blinded by their rage with no other goal but to kill them? This is why we think differently of wrestling versus lynching. Lynching has that intended result. Lynching if you're not understanding of what lynching is, it is the extrajudicial killing of people, often by hanging. Began in pre-Civil War South in the 1830s and ended during the Civil Rights Movement of the 1950s and 60s. While there are people from all different types of ethnicities that were lynched, the vast majority of them coincided with the great migration of African Americans out of the South and were often done to enforce white supremacy and to intimidate ethnic minorities. Many times lynching victims were accused of murder, rape, or other type of crimes. And it would end with the person being lynched. Except here's the problem. They did a study from 1929 to 1940 over the span of 11 years they took a look at the study of a hundred lynchings and what was actually known about such scenarios, and it was determined that over a third of them, if not more, were falsely accused. And even those who were guilty of such crimes were not crimes that they were accused of, but crimes significantly lesser that by no means required the response of capital punishment. As I describe these lynchings to you, let me ask you a question. What kind of emotional reaction does it draw out of you? What do you think about such a topic and such a scene? Sadness? Disgust? 
embarrassment, a historical distancing. So thankful that's not us. Wrestling is entertaining, yet lynching is disgusting. Why? Because lynching is the tragic story of so many innocent people killed in some of the most barbaric ways. Well, this evening, we return to the Gospel of Matthew, specifically chapter 22. And I want to make sure as you read along, you don't read the narrative as if you're watching a wrestling match. As if you're historically curious, maybe even entertained by the characters, and you don't feel the emotion. You don't understand the gravity of what's taking place. For a lynching is about to take place. I want you to see where these events are headed in Matthew 22. The tension is building. We're in Wednesday, in the middle of the Passion Week. This final week of Jesus' life. Within 24 hours of the event we're going to read about tonight, Jesus will be arrested and rejected by his closest disciples. Just take that in. Within 24 hours of the incident we're going to read right now, this evening together, Jesus will be arrested and rejected. Within 36 hours, he will be tortured, arguably beyond recognition. Within 48 hours of the scene we're about to describe, Jesus will also be hanging on a tree, but not by a rope around his neck, but by spikes driven through his wrists and driven through the center of his feet that are overlapping for crimes he never committed. That's the emotion. That's the gravity and the reality of what's unfolding before us. Yet 48 hours before that scene would take place, there is yet another conversation, another trap, another attempt to trick him. And this is where we are tonight in Matthew 22. So if you would, look with me at the text. Matthew 22, starting in verse 23, as I read through verse 33. The same day, referring to Wednesday, Sadducees came to him who say that there is no resurrection. And they asked him a question saying, teacher, Moses said, if a man dies having no children, his brother must marry the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. Now, there were seven brothers among us. The first married and died, having no offspring, left his wife to his brother. So too the second and third, down to the seventh. After them all, the woman died. In the resurrection, therefore, of the seven, whose life will she be? For they all had her. Verse 29. But Jesus answered them, you are wrong because you know neither the Scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. And as for the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was said to you by God? I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not God of the dead, but of the living. When the crowd heard it, they were astonished at his teaching. We'll stop there for our purposes tonight. The day will not end with this story, but for what we need to cover tonight, this will give us enough to marinate on, because there are some important takeaways that we need to walk away with from our text this evening as we begin to kind of slow the tape down and now look at it together. First of all, 
be aware of people who want to use the Bible to discredit it. Be aware of people who want to use the Bible to discredit it. Now, may I just remind you of the scene that's been unfolding before. Jesus has been in the middle of this day, this day that began back on Wednesday as it's being referenced in Matthew 21, verse 23. You don't need to turn all the way back there. But he's been in these different conversations, these different attempts to discredit him. And as we saw last week, we saw the significance of the disciples of the Pharisees, as we saw in verse 22, chapter 22, verse 15 and following, and the Herodians, these two unlikely of enemies of each other coming up now together to be able to undermine and discredit Jesus, to finding a way to not simply discredit him, but as the Pharisees plotted to do, to arrest him, to turn him over to be killed. Well, now we're introduced to another group here. They're known as the Sadducees. Now, back in Matthew chapter 3, many, many months ago is when we first met them. And quite honestly, Matthew doesn't talk much about them because honestly, they're not out and about throughout all of the land of Israel. They're kind of centralized and localized in Jerusalem. That's where they're at as a people. Now, the Sadducees are not to be thought of as just simply another like-minded group of the Pharisees. So just to, again, as a point of compare and contrast, the Pharisees are like a smaller group of the larger Jewish people, a smaller group of about 6,000 people. The Sadducees are a different group of people. While the Pharisees were legalistic and had all these extra laws, the Sadducees were not. In fact, the Sadducees are what you could consider as liberals. But they were committed to the temple. They were aristocrats. They were kind of known in their places of authority, often rich, often of noble association. But they denied the things that were supernatural. They denied the resurrection of the dead, and they denied the existence of angels. Unlike the Pharisees, they rejected human tradition. They hated legalism. They accepted only the Torah as actually God's word. You say, what's the Torah? That's what the Jewish word would be to describe the first five books of your Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, those first five books, often sometimes referred to as the Pentateuch, the five books is what that word stands for there. The Sadducees said that's the only part that we think is God's word. And if it's not there, we don't believe it. And they used that as justification for why they didn't believe in the resurrection. Admittedly, the resurrection, the doctrine, the teaching of the resurrection is developed more throughout the Old Testament. Books like Isaiah develops it. Books like Daniel develops it. Continuing into the New Testament gives us more context, understanding of it. Well, they would have decried all of those writings as actually being from God. And so here they are now with this rejection of the resurrection They have a question for Jesus. And their question for Jesus is based on a Levitical Jewish teaching. They assume that their question will stump Jesus theologically. And you have to kind of wonder, have you never been listening about these other conversations? Has word not gotten out? Like, you might want to tread very carefully here if you're going to go up against Jesus of Nazareth. It has not gone well for any other opposing critic before you. And yet, nevertheless, blinded by their pride... They believe, we've got this. Sit back, watch and learn as we stump him. Be amazed as we humiliate him. And what's interesting is what they do is they want to show that Jesus is not qualified as a theological leader. They want to show that he is not able to take the authority. And so when they use this term teacher, as you can see there in the text, Verse 24, teacher, this term is almost a bit said in a kind of a sarcastic way. It's recognizing how others respected him, but they don't intend to offer the same respect as well. They will intend now begin to throw a riddle at him. And so they throw this riddle, and then basically the riddle is essentially, according to Jewish law, According to what's said in Deuteronomy for the Levites, as far as what is the expected understanding of a man's response to a wife, and they thought the most extreme scenario. Because the scenario according to Jewish law is, if a man was married and he dies, 
Well, according to Jewish law, the man's surviving brother should marry the wife in order to honor the dead brother that his lineage might continue as she's being provided for and her namesake, the brother's namesake, would continue on. And they're like, hey, I've got one for you. What if he not only had one brother or two brothers? What if he had six brothers? And so as a time, they each keep dying in this extreme scenario. And then she dies. Jesus, to which brother is she married when she dies after the resurrection? It's such a hypocritical question because they don't believe in the resurrection. They're asking a question that they have no intention to learn the answer about or to consider. Friends, this was the Sadducees' practice with Jesus. The Sadducees implied that heaven was simply an extension of things that are on earth that most men enjoy, such as a marital relationship. If this woman had seven husbands, how could her relationship be possible? They're trying to make it basically appear that the resurrection is ridiculous. Who could believe such thing? And Jesus, since you claim to believe these things, let's prove you to be a fool yourself. Now, this is not unique to the Sadducees. It's not unique to 2,000 years ago. Perhaps you've had conversations with your friends, family members. Perhaps you've even posed these kind of questions yourself. I have a question of you, Christian. I have a riddle I'd like you to solve, and if you could solve this riddle, then I will believe. And here comes the questions, one after the other. You know, questions like, if God is so big and God is so powerful, can he make a rock that he can't even lift? Depending how you answer the question, it seems like you limits the power of God. Oh, got you, Christian. So you have no answer for that from your Bible. These questions... These intentions, these motives are only intentions to support why they have already reached their conclusions that they've reached. Be aware of the question asker who has no attempt to listen, but only to talk. No desire to learn, but only to trick. No willingness to change, but only to denounce. If you are asked a question and you don't know the answer to it, dear Christian, do not panic because you do not know the answer does not mean that there's not an answer. Just means perhaps at that time you're not prepared to answer it. You can certainly say to them, it's a great question. Let me go learn more from the Bible about that, and I'm happy to come back and talk about it more with you. And see just how often willing they are to actually want to talk about such questions, interact with such subjects, want to learn such truths, or if these are just constant exercises to denounce you for calling you a fool in believing that Jesus of Nazareth, this 2,000-year-old rabbi, is actually risen from the grave and reigns today at the right hand of God and is the Son of God himself. If you find yourself in such context with such scenarios, don't be surprised. Such people love to use the Bible to discredit it. But the truth is, they're simply selectively using the parts of the Bible that they think they know so well to support their rejection of the God that they do not know well at all. Now, interestingly, what happens here is it comes from the least likeliest of people, religious people, religious people. This is a common thing we see today in this sort of new wave of, you know, deconstructionism. The new popularity is to basically have these YouTubers and other type of social media personalities who say, hi, I used to think like you. I used to read like you. I used to go to places like this. I used to do baptisms like that. I I know everything that you're talking about, but, but trust me, I have since learned the truth about this. And I'm here to come back and tell you that you can be unleashed from this sort of mental shackles that religion has you in and better understand the better way. Friends, such pride, the problem is not with you. The problem was with God who created them and their lack of desire to submit to him and said to create a God of their own choosing. And this takes us to the second lesson we can see here. The first one is to be aware of people who want to use the Bible to discredit it. The second lesson is there is life after death, but not marriage. There is life after death, but not marriage. Look at verse 29. Jesus answered them, 
you are wrong. Because you know neither the Scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. Friends, this is profound, not because of what Jesus is saying to them, but because of the implication of what he's saying to us. Jesus is giving the Sadducees a strong rebuke. Of, of all the people, certainly they should have known God's word and God's power. God's word taught the resurrection. His power can bring people back to life. And what Jesus is doing here is connecting their false beliefs to what they used to say that they believed. This includes beliefs about heaven and about marriage. Jesus said heaven is not simply an extension of the pleasures that people enjoy here on earth. In fact, in heaven, marriage will be unnecessary. Now, this is significant for a number of reasons. First of all, let's just consider this. If you're not a Christian, or you are a Christian, Every person, no matter whether or not you profess Christ, has to deal with the reality of a couple kind of fundamental issues as to how you think and how you support what you think. Think of these four questions. Number one, where did I come from? Number two, what is the meaning of this life that I'm now here living? Number three, how am I supposed to live while I'm here? Number four, what happens after I die? Origin, meaning, morality, destiny. And your answers have to be logical. You just can't make up random things that make you feel good. You actually have to answer them in a coherent way and answer the question, why do you believe what you believe about your answer to those four questions? For those of you who are Christians, you recognize those answers come explicitly, undeniably, comfortingly, and factually from the Bible. For those of you who are not Christians, perhaps still wrestling with your own answers to that question, you have to ask yourself, from what authority, from what source, from what voice are you going to listen to and to say, well, here's what I believe. The question is, why do you believe that? And what gives you confidence that what you believe is Right? And if what you believed was wrong, would you want to know? Jesus loves people to the point where he wants to make sure that if what they believed was wrong, he loves them enough to tell them the truth. And not everybody wants to hear that truth. Not everybody wants to receive the reality of that. But Jesus loved them enough to tell them that so that they would not be fooled into damnation for all of eternity. For those of you who are not Christians, friend, you have to ask yourself the question, if Jesus believes that there is life after death, what do I believe, and am I prepared for that conclusion? To those of you who are Christians, you know the reality of why we take such comfort, such peace in our decision to follow Christ, because it's a decision, as we heard wonderfully from both Zach and Daisy, it's not based on our good works, it's not based on our religious identification, it's not based on our lack of seemingly immorality, it is only in faith in Christ. And it's not the faith that saves us, it's Christ who saves us. We recognize that and take delight in that, and as Jesus is now describing, there is life after death. Think of it like this. If you're not a Christian, and I don't say that judgmentally or self-righteously, I just say that positionally in what you believe, if you're not a Christian, the reality is this life is as close as you will ever get to experiencing heaven. This is as good as it's going to get. If you are a Christian and your faith is in Christ, the reality is this life is as close to hell as you're ever going to get. It will never for you 
and it will never be as bad for you as it is right now in this fallen world. This truth of life after death is a point of comfort for some and concern for others. Are you comforted by what Jesus is saying here tonight? You can be. You can be if your faith is in Christ. But if you're concerned, friend, because you continue to reject the invitation of Christ, who says himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You have every right to be concerned. Other part of what he's describing here is not just the reality of eternal life, it's also the reality of human relationships, specifically that of marriage. He says in verse 30, in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. What's he describing here? He's describing what I think sometimes people forget. Marriage is temporary. Marriage is temporary. Singleness is eternal. If you are single now, I want to be very clear, you are not an incomplete person. You're not waiting to be made whole. You're not like a JV individual waiting to make the cut of varsity. Friend, God created you the way he created you and is ordaining relationships in your life. And if God has you to be single, then that singleness is not some type of like regrettable reality. It is a sign of what's to come. But for those of you who are married today or in the future to come, your marriage is indeed a gift from God. And it's a profound gift for a number of reasons. One is because in marriage you have the gift of procreation. Fancy word for being able to have children. In marriage, you have the profound opportunity to illustrate the power of the gospel between Christ and the church, a profound institution that God ordains to teach such a story. But when he says that in in future, in heaven, that you are like the angels, he's saying you don't have to do that anymore. That's not your role anymore. So the reality is, for those of you who are married today or in the years to come, That is but a temporary relationship that you will not have nor need for all of eternity to come. It is a gift to be enjoyed and to be appreciated, but it is not an identifiable marker of the reality of your relationship with God for all of eternity. Which takes us to the third takeaway from this text Jesus thinks your Bible is from God. Jesus thinks your Bible that you have in your hand right now is from God. Look at what he says in verse 31. He's continuing his response to the Sadducees. He says, and as for the resurrection of the dead, he's like, let's talk about this now. He's talked about marriage, now let's talk about the resurrection from the dead. And then he says this, have you not read what was said to you by God? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. He is not God of the dead, but of the living. Okay, now, I realize this is probably lost in a lot of you here, so let me just tell you what's happening. He's talking to a group of people called the Sadducees, who only believe the first part of your Bible is actually the Bible from God, and nothing else that they're going to believe. He's like, okay, you want to play this game? We can play this game. He's basically saying, hey, turn in your Bibles. You don't have to do this, but this is what he's kind of doing and he's talking to him. To Exodus chapter 3. That's in the Pentateuch. He's like, you want me to play by your rules? Let's play by your rules. We'll go to just the Pentateuch. We'll go to just the Torah. And I'll ask you this question. Have you not read? It's one of those questions that already has an answer. They've read but they missed it entirely. Because he says, Moses is saying there in the text, I speaking about God, where he says, I am the God of Abraham. I am the God of Isaac. I am the God of Jacob. Now you're like, who are these people? These are Old Testament, what's known as patriarchs. You can call them like the Godfathers of Israel. And the way that God self-identifies himself in relation to him is not, 
I was the God of Abraham. I was the God of Isaac. I was the God of Jacob. He's saying, I am. How if they're not around? Because they are still around. Though you do not see them, God is saying, I am with them. The overwhelming reality that the Sadducees were so loath to accept. This threefold repetition, I am the God of Abraham, I am the God of Isaac, I am the God of Jacob, this threefold repetition would have been impressive. Presumably even the Sadducees, like many others, would have been attracted to the majesty of this text, like a Deuteronomy 6 text. These words that they had been told to them, they would have known these things as, yes, yes, this God of Abraham, yes, God of Isaac, this like, yes, they took pride in this. This is like their family tree, we're with them. Jesus is like, you've been reading a text for years and you've been missing it the entire time. And what I love is what Jesus says there in verse 30. He says, have you not read what was said to you by God? But Jesus, didn't Moses? Didn't Moses write Genesis? Didn't Moses write Exodus, the very passage you're you're quoting? The answer is yes. But he just says it's written by God. Yes. So is the Bible written by men or is it written by God? Yes. Like, how do you explain that? Like, well, the best attempt I can give you is 2 Peter. Where Peter says, men moved along by the Holy Spirit, spoke from God. Friends, Jesus is endorsing. Jesus is teaching this doctrine, this teaching of inspiration. God breathe word. Starting with the very foundation of all of the Bible, the Torah, the Pentateuch, the first five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and that very foundation by which all other prophets and, and writers and poets would speak back to and continue to describe. As Jesus throughout his ministry would quote from these other sections of scripture, referring to them indeed as from God. Friends, do not let some critic grab your Bible out of your hand and say, this isn't from God. Do not let them take it from you as if to say, by a few of their little talking points that you kind of feel stumped in, that you're like, man, I I kind of feel embarrassed. I've been kind of trusting in this thing as if it's maybe mythology. Friend, do not be so easily persuaded by such arguments. You have no one less than Jesus himself who is endorsing the very words you have in your hand. People will often say, well, you know, the Bible, it's basically like mythology. It's not like mythology. Mythology is not historical. The Bible is with real people in real places. Mythology has no confirmation in science. The Bible does. Mythology has no fulfilled prophecy. The Bible has hundreds of them. Mythology has no transformed lives from it. The Bible has countless of transformed lives over thousands of years. They've been changed by it. And in this room are hundreds of people who have been transformed by it. The problem is not the Bible's accuracy or source. The problem is man's refusal to accept it and submit to it. As it was for the Sadducees, as it could be for people today. We find great confidence and assurance that what we have in our hand is indeed from God. This takes us to the fourth takeaway, number four. People are astonished by Jesus' teachings. Are you? Are you? There's the expression, you maybe have seen it. It often refers to the social media clips that are caught of people doing stupid things that they thought they could get away with and they get in trouble. And the expression is, play stupid games, win stupid prizes. Sadducee, foolish. You want to go up against the Son of God about the Word of God, about the resurrection of God, you're going to win a stupid prize. And that's exactly what happens. Look at verse 34. 
Jumping down one verse. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees. It's interesting just how literally we, we've got him. We've got him. This is a guaranteed arm bar. He will not get out of it. Basically smacks the question away and with one response back has silenced them. Meanwhile, all of the people who've got a front row seat to this whole conversation, look at their response. Look at what it says there in verse 33. When the crowd heard it, they were astonished. They were amazed. Why would they be so amazed? Well, it's the same thing that continued to happen throughout Jesus' ministry. Every time he taught, it blew their minds. It's how the Sermon on the Mount, the most famous sermon ever preached, ends. It says in Matthew chapter 7, verse 28, when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. The question about whether or not you're amazed at Jesus' teaching says a lot about you, perhaps more than you even realize. Your, your appetite for this, your, your delight in this, your desire to discover this, your desire to apply this and to own this says a lot about where you are in relationship to him. And I, I say that not in any way to embarrass or in any way to defraud. I say that just to kind of help you get an accurate assessment as to what you think about the teachings of Christ. A source of delight constant desire to discover the Word of God or something else. Another attempt to go back and find a way to denounce it, to discredit it, to deny it. We know how they responded. The question is, what about you? Are you astonished or are you unmoved in your unbelief? Are you submitted or do you still want to rebel? They wanted to. And they were so caught up and eventually in that blind rage that they would settle for nothing less than lynching. Nothing less than an unrighteous killing of an innocent man. That's how badly they wanted to silence their conscience. To turn off the word of God in order to turn off the conviction of God. Now, for those of us who are Christians, when we come to this, we're basically just seeing the reality of who our Savior is. And there's a dual reality to what I just said at the beginning of this time together. You'd like to think that unlike his disciples, you would follow him to the end. You would not denounce him. You not in any way dismiss him. You would say committed to him. But there is a gut check that's coming in the weeks ahead as we continue through the text to watch his closest followers win under pressure from those around him to denounce him, they gave into it. That's the same pressure we have today. And I'm just appealing to you, pleading with you by the power of the Spirit of God working within you as we saw privately here in this room, in the middle of this building in Miami, the city of Miami, that what you profess to believe here, you'd be committed and renewed yet again tonight to go practice out there. That you would be a people who are not only astonished here at the teachings of Christ, but that you would undeniably go live out there so that people could see you to be who you profess to be and who I profess to be. Not perfect, but by God's grace, a follower of Christ for our good and for his glory.